My talk today will be more physics oriented. I'm going to talk about uh, the ultimate future of the universe, specifically of computers and humanity. We asked the question in this TED conference, who's going to save the world? I'm going to argue today that the laws of physics are going to save the world. Not a usual savior that we think of. Let's however put some perspective on this. We have to remember that the earth is doomed. Why? Because we know that the sun will inevitably one day expand out and vaporize this planet. Um, but you might want to wonder, uh, should we care about this? This is five billion years into the future. But um, I want to argue that uh, five billion years, it seems a distant future, but I'm going to argue today, you might actually be there. The first thing to keep in mind, however, that we can't take a small perspective. Sustainability in the short run is ultimately, in the long run, unsustainable. If the humanity and indeed the entire biosphere is to survive, we have no choice. We have to move off of this earth. Now once the expansion of life off of this planet begins, there is nothing to stop it. There is nothing to stop the biosphere from ultimately engulfing the entire universe. What I'm going to do is to give you what we physicists call a space-time picture of life and the universe from now, actually from its very beginning, into the ultimate future, provided that the universe is spatially finite. We use the term, technical term, closed. That means it's like the, in three dimensions, but it's like the surface of the earth. You know that if you go in that direction, just keep going straight in that direction, you'll eventually return to your starting point from that direction. The universe is spatially closed. That would be true in any direction. We go in that direction, we eventually return to the Earth in that direction, and so forth. Now let's look at the space-time diagram. What we have in the space-time diagram is in the horizontal direction is envisaged to be space. In the vertical direction, going up, we're moving forward into time. Now, the universe began, we know, about 15 billion years ago in an initial singularity um, in the uh, extreme left-hand vertical um, line. We have the Earth's history, Earth's location. Um, now what I'm projecting is that eventually the expansion of the biosphere off of the Earth will begin and in ultimately going over to the other side of the universe represented that, that vertical line which is the history of the Earth's location's antipodal point um, in reality and keep going until we come into the final singularity which is uh, a state of infinite density but as we'll see utterly different from the initial singularity because life will be there which was not the case. Now I'm going to argue something even stronger namely that the laws of physics themselves will actually require the biosphere to expand outward and engulf the universe. We humans do not have the death option. We humans, in spite of all contrary appearances, really do not have the power to annihilate ourselves. The laws of physics will not permit us to do that. Now let me prove this statement. Now I'm going to give you a warning ahead of time. I'm going to give you a heavy math, at least in words, argument. What do you expect? This is a physics argument, and it's not philosophy, it's heavy science. Okay, the first step in the argument is to prove that the universe can actually not expand forever, but has to end in a final singularity. The mathematical steps in outline go as follows. Hawking proved some 30 years ago that if black holes actually exist, and we've seen them, we know that they do exist, and were the universe to expand forever, then unitarity would be violated. I know you've never heard that word, but it's a fundamental property of this fundamental theory of the universe called quantum mechanics. Um, since unitarity cannot be violated, 
The Hawking argument then shows the universe cannot expand forever. The second step, I have to prove that barriers to unlimited communication back and forth across the universe cannot exist. Why is this important? Well, if the biosphere is to be indeed a united whole, um, you have to communicate. We humans are able to succeed in what we're doing because we can communicate with, with each other. We can talk to each other. I can get your ideas. You can receive ideas from myself and so forth. It is necessary for the biosphere to survive. That unlimited communication cannot, um, has to be permitted near the end of time. Now, technically, as a mathematical fact, this amounts to proving that event horizons cannot exist. Now, I, what I'm going to give is a proof by contradiction. I'm going to suppose first that event horizons did exist. Then I can do a simple mathematical calculation that shows quantum mechanics in its uh, form as the uncertainty principle in, in thrown into the language of relativity. It's called the Bekenstein bound. That set of laws in the presence of event horizons would force a violation of the second law of thermodynamics, which is one of the most fundamental laws of physics. That's not possible, hence no event horizons. Now, let me give an aside. If the universe has no event horizons, then it is possible to prove mathematically in that case that the universe necessarily has to be spatially closed. Thus, the special the final singularity actually has to be a very special type of singularity. Mathematically, we say it has to be a single point in the Penrose Sea Boundary construction. Never mind that. Point is that it's at the very end of time. It's the ultimate future, um, and it has a special point-like structure. Let's call it an omega point. Now, having established that, let me also prove that life has to be present all the way into the omega point and furthermore let me show that life's power and knowledge must actually increase without limit as the omega point is approached. Now event horizon absence in itself would be a violation of the second law of thermodynamics unless, and this is, requires a lot of argument that I'll have to leave out, you can, unless the universe actually is guided through an infinite number of very special states. Now, this itself is going to be possible. You can show by a more detailed argument that only if life is present and furthermore, the possession of knowledge possessed by life actually approaches infinity. Implications. Let's remember that ultimately knowledge is information stored in a computer memory. And life ultimately is a very special type of uh, computer. Um, now, computer theorists and we physicists just mean by a computer, a finite state machine. That means something that has a state, it's finite in fundamental structure, and goes to another state. That's a very general notion of a computer. That's what we physicists use in order to prove these general statements. Okay, thus knowledge becomes infinite. This means that the information we store in our computers in the ultimate far future is diverging to infinity. Now, a fact, remarkably, is that the humans in the entire visible universe are actually, as I've said, a finite state machine. You can prove this using quantum mechanics. You can go further. You can give an upper bound to the complexity of the universe in the present state. It's a double exponential, 10 raised to the 10 to the 123rd power, bytes of memory as all that is needed to code all possible visible universes in the computers of the far future. Huge number, tiny, tiny in comparison to infinity. This means life in the far future could code a perfect simulation, a perfect emulation, we say, of the entire universe in the computers of the far future using only an insignificant fraction of the total computer memory in the far future. If they did, we actually would be resurrected, brought back into existence. That's what I'm saying. This event of the Earth's destruction five billion years in the future is important to each and every one of us because we will be there, brought back into existence in the computer in the far future, trillions of years after that event. Furthermore, 
after the resurrection, we could actually have an infinite number of new experiences as computer emulations and remember all of them. Eternal life for one and all. And it is likely, in fact, that far future life will indeed resurrect us, never to die again. Because what are we doing right now? We are trying to resurrect, to bring back into existence that our own ultimate ancestor, that single living cell from which the entire biosphere, including ourselves, are descended. We are the ultimate ancestor of that far future life, so they would be as interested in resurrecting us as we are in resurrecting our own ultimate ancestor. Note that the omega point is a state outside of the universe um, of infinite power and knowledge. As Walter told you, the omega point, which is I've borrowed for a technical reason, actually is the term for God used by the uh, French theologian Thierry de Chardin. Famous German theologian Wolfhard Pannenberg has actually written that if you go through in detail all the properties which the omega point actually has, according to my calculations, the omega point would indeed be Judeo-Christian God. So, the idea that the final state of the universe is actually God is a European idea, not American. Thank you, guys. If the omega point is indeed God, then we don't have the option of separating science and religion. We have to accept the consequences of the laws of physics and the existence of the omega point and ultimately our future existence as resurrected individuals never to die again is another implication. But perhaps there are other laws of physics of which we know nothing. After all, wasn't classical mechanics replaced in the 20th century by relativity and quantum mechanics? Remarkably, no. You can show mathematically that in spite of what is generally taught, that both relativity and quantum mechanics are nothing but special cases of classical mechanics. I can demonstrate this with a Venn diagram. Overall, we see classical mechanics, including everything. This is the mechanics created by Newton. As subsets included in that are quantum mechanics, relativity, and one of the great achievements of 20th century, late 20th century physics, the standard model, the theory of all uh, forces except uh, for gravity, already included in relativity. The intersection of all these gives us reality. So, conclusion, there is no evidence whatsoever that there are any unknown laws. In other words, we've actually had a theory of everything for some 50 years. It just hasn't been accepted yet. Okay, now, furthermore, this claim that the known laws will be superseded by strings or brains or other sorts of uh, of physical theories or anything in fact that would stop life from stopping for example the current acceleration of the universe which were it to continue would indeed wipe us all out um, this can actually be tested experimentally we can actually test if we will live eternally now it's a simple experiment to do all you have to do is make certain measurements of a very special kind that I have specified on the cosmic microwave background radiation easy experiment to do, then we will know if in fact we indeed can trust these laws of physics. I do. We have no evidence experimentally that anything is wrong with them. But let's have some additional evidence. Whether we live forever is an important question to really investigate in detail. The laws of physics in summary I claim will save us. The laws of physics before us, who can be against us? Thank you. <laughs>